The story of this forbidden anime begins in an unoccupied room. While bathed in the golden hues of the sun, Nami and Junko fuse their Gardens of Eden with a pair of scissors until a flood breaks out in both gardens. In a different room, Hiroko is doing a tarot reading for her Ri and Saki. She draws the Wheel of Fortune, which means something in their life will change completely. However, their conversation is interrupted when Council President Nami enters the room after overhearing them. Nami clearly looks down on their hobby, so Hiroko warns her not to take witchcraft lightly as it's been a part of people's lives since ancient times. The power of darkness can perform miracles. Isn't that fascinating? She even offers her a book to read. Nami, however, is just repulsed by all this. She says it's ridiculous before walking away. While her friends make faces at Nami behind her back, Hiroko quietly stares at the open card. The fool. The following day, Nami arrives in a fancy car. Seeing as she's got a whole chauffeur and all, the girl's got her money up for sure. But when she turns to the side, she sees Reika, a sweet girl who's new to town. Though she made her way to school hungry, she happily feeds a dog a part of her snack. The sight makes Nami smile, only for a more mischievous look to cross her visage. Elsewhere, Ri brings an ancient magic book to Saki and Hiroko. She found it at an antique shop the other day, and seeing how old it is, the book must be handwritten. Suddenly, Junko comes up to them to announce that their request to form a club has been denied. With a smug look, she says that there's no way the higher-ups would allow them to have such a silly club. While Saki and Ri are upset, Hiroko doesn't let the setback get her down. Instead, she urges them to translate the book with her. Later on, Nami introduces herself to Reika in the bathroom. Though the new girl appreciates her helpfulness, she's quickly bothered by how pushy Nami is. When Nami leaves, Hiratani tries to confess to her, but she quickly shuts him down. She's not into men, but even if she were, he's out of the question. Later that evening, Saki, Ri, and Hiroko are working on translating the book when Hiroko decides to try out a spell. The first one she finds is an incantation to make someone dance in their default skin, and Saki has just the person in mind to try that spell on. The following day, Nami addresses her peers at a podium. It's soon Junko's turn to speak, but the girl's a mess. It doesn't take long before she puts on her default skin, and her demeanor completely changes. Now armed with enough culture to start a country, she invites everyone to look at her while she tends to her puddled Garden of Eden until it floods. Everyone is shocked by the display, especially Nami and the three culprits. Many people are openly getting a kick out of what's happening, especially the guys and some of the staff. The entire thing becomes a popular topic for everyone, and Saki's very happy about it. She even walks up to Nami, saying that they might make her dance next. Though Nami still doesn't believe in magic, she can't deny the strangeness of what happened to Junko. At the rooftop, Hiroko lightly chides Saki for telling so many people about the spell. Their conversation, however, is soon interrupted by Hiratani. Meanwhile, since Reika needs a mentor, Nami decides to help her. The two are alone in a room, and it doesn't take long for Nami to go in for a CPR practice session. Despite Reika's refusal, Nami still exposes her milky ways so she can explore them. Unbeknownst to the two, someone is sneaking up to Nami's back and slipping a paper doll with her initials inside it. Eventually, Reika manages to stop Nami's advances, which deeply upsets the girl. Nobody's ever rejected her before. She spitefully takes her leave, while Reika's still shaken up. The next day, Nami sees Reika feeding the dog again. She approaches her to apologize, and Reika clearly isn't happy to see her. But before Nami could finish speaking, she spots Hiratani among the crowd. For some reason, the very sight of him fills her with culture, so she rushes to link her arm with his. The people around them are in complete disbelief. No way is Nami willingly being seen in public with an outcast like Hiratani. Oh, but she is. And Nami looks completely down bad for the guy who looks like he can audition for any patient zero role and pass it without even speaking. During lunchtime, Nami lets Hiratani get cultural with her. She's like a completely different person, a far cry from her haughty and domineering self. At that point, she's all culture and no pride. Nami lets Hiratani slither his Slytherin into her chamber of secrets and she even lets him fill it with its white venom directly. But that's not enough. She urges him to call her by her first name and even lets the Slytherin knock on her chamber off Secret's back door. While her unrestrained cultural sounds could be heard from outside the room, Saki, Rie, and Hiroko listened with solemn faces. Saki and Rie believe that this could be Hiroko's tarot, which tells them, something will change your life completely. While Hiroko isn't sure of that, what she can say for certain is that the book is real. One day, 
A defeated Junko stands among her peers, who are openly gossiping about her. Unable to take the shame anymore, she tries to get hit by a car, but the vehicle stops before the collision. Unharmed, Junko weakly falls to the ground while the rest of her peers walk ahead, talking about how she's lost it. Almost everyone does this, including the fellas who celebrated her performance. The only one who comes to her aid is a very concerned Rika. She helps Junko walk, and the girl only perks up when she sees Nami exit her car. But to her surprise, Hiratani follows after her, and she promptly performs a quick CPR on him, leaving Junko completely heartbroken. As for the trio, they're making bank out of their witchcraft. They help maidenless guys find a date, and jealous ladies get a leg up on the ones they're envious of. It's shady and morally bankrupt. But who cares when they're rolling in dough? Saki, Ri, and Hiroko are getting stonks up. While everyone around them is getting their culture up, Hiroko can even propel people away with just a touch. So not even the council can stop them and their growing club, the Rose Cross Club. It gets to the point where the once proud and skeptical Nami begs for their help, saying she knows they practice witchcraft. Hiratani's been cold to her lately, and she needs them to make him want only her. Of course, Hiroko agrees on the condition that she give them a sanctuary for their meetings, so Nami takes them to a secluded place. With that out of the way, Hiroko performs her ritual on Nami, but instead of doing what she begged her to, she makes the girl snap back to her senses. Immediately, Nami's cold demeanor resurfaces, and after learning about why she fell in love with Hiratani, she runs away. The following day, Nami has her goons beat up Hiratani at a warehouse, and she calmly instructs the leader not to kill him. Meanwhile, Hiroko tells her friends that Nami's joining them. She's very happy to have someone who once looked down on them begging to join their club, and she's sure that with their book, Nami can't get revenge on them. In another room, Nami forces Reika to purify and get Hiratani's stench off her. She keeps prodding at Reika's no-no square and circles until she slaps Nami, even calling her out of her mind. Instead of being upset, Nami just smiles knowingly at Reika before leaving. Later on, Nami meets with Hiroko and the other club members and learns that they will perform a ritual to summon the demon. They want to get him on their side and make him use his powers for them. If the practice goes well, they'll summon something much bigger on the next night of Walpurgis, the night where the power of darkness is at its strongest. For now, they need a sacrifice for the ritual to work, and without thinking twice, Nami volunteers to prepare it. As she leaves, Hiroko comments that she's changed, a sentiment that Nami returns to her. In a horrific turn of events, the sacrifice they use is the dog that Rake has been doting on day after day. The ritual is a success, but nothing could have prepared the girls for the demon's chilling appearance. Without even letting them process his presence, he uses his Slytherins to pull a shocked Hiroko towards him, breaking through her chamber of secrets. While Hiroko eventually finds amusement in it, things quickly escalate as the other entrances to her chamber of secrets are also explored. Soon, all the entrances are filled with the demon's white venom, and it disappears immediately after that. A convulsing Hiroko falls to the ground, and while her club members rush to her aid, Nami watches on with a nefarious smile. During her day off, Reika's looking for her beloved dog when Nami's goon approaches, asking her to help him with a wounded puppy. At a cafe, Nami convinces the reluctant Saki and Ri to proceed with that night's ritual. She's already prepared a sacrifice, a girl with a cherry blossom tree in her chamber of secrets. Of course, that girl is none other than Reika. The goons bring her to the warehouse, where Nami maliciously throws her a plastic bag with the dog's body. Reika is completely horrified, but that's just the beginning. Nami allows her goons to explore her chamber of secrets, but they aren't allowed to cut down her cherry blossom tree. At the hospital, Hiroko finally comes to, and she quickly realizes that it's the night of Walpurgis. With Nami gone, the goons get to invading Reika's chamber of secrets. The leader even goes against Nami's orders and cuts down her cherry blossom tree with his Slytherin. While the Rose Cross Club is preparing for their ritual, Hiroko arrives to stop them. They're just amateurs messing with things beyond their comprehension, and they'll undoubtedly get hurt if they go on, unmoved. Nami uses a spell to propel Hiroko away from her, and while her friends rush to help her up, Nami thinks about how she'll take revenge on the three of them when she gets the power. Despite Hiroko's attempts to dissuade her friends, Saki and Ri merely bound her, apologizing before leaving for the ceremony. Their ritual begins with a sacrifice. Reika is wide-eyed as her stomach is impaled by Nami's blade, she wonders why this is happening to her, but there is no answer. Only Nami's chance. Soon, 
She realizes that the gate of Orcus is not opening all the way, and her guess is there isn't enough blood. Before the other members could do anything, Nami swiftly beheads one of the girls, causing panic among the rest of them. They accuse her of losing her mind, and Nami merely answers that they've all lost their minds already. There is no hesitation in Nami as she sends the rest of them to the afterlife. Only madness, a consuming hunger for power. With a laugh, she beckons Berzelt to come and grant her his powers. But just as the gate is fully opening, Nami feels her own blade plunge into her back. And wielding it is none other than Reika, in all her bloodied and dying glory. When a horrified Nami turns to her, Reika screams before swinging down the blade. Nami collapses to the ground. While Reika falls, too. It hurts. Everything hurts. To her surprise, the demon speaks to her from his realm, asking if she wants to live and form a contract with him. At that point, Reika's running purely on fear and pain, and all she can do is repeat that she doesn't want to go to the afterlife again and again. After some time, Hiroki finally manages to break free from her binds. She rushes to the ritual room, only to be greeted by a terrible sight. Meanwhile, Reika now has a new lease on life. With a pained smile, she walks along the empty streets, her body still bloodied as the sun finally rises, putting an end to that horrific night. Though Reika lived, is she still herself? Or has that night changed her beyond recognition? Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.